First of all, very, very warm welcome to you all. I'm Rabbi Alexandra Wright from the Liberal Jewish Synagogue. And um, some months ago, actually now, quite a few months, seems like a, a long time ago, Rabbi Dr. Michael Hilton, who's here, approached me to ask whether the Liberal Jewish Synagogue would be willing to co-host together with René Cassin a solidarity iftar with the Muslim Uyghur community in order to highlight and raise awareness about the plight of the Uyghur community in China, where over one million Uyghurs have been detained in so-called re-education camps, separating families and effectively eradicating the cultural identity of the Uyghur community. We could not know then that we would be in lockdown and therefore hosting this meeting online. However, I hope that we've been able to attract good numbers to hear our distinguished guests, Dal Kun Isa, President of the World Uyghur Congress, Mr. Togunjan Alodun, Director of the Commun Committee for Religious Affairs of the World Uyghur Congress, as well as personal testimonies from members of the Uyghur community, all of whom will be introduced shortly by Mia Hassanson Gross, Executive Director of René Cassin. I'm also delighted to welcome Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner, Senior Rabbi of the Movement for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Dr. Michael Hilton, Emeritus Rabbi of Kol Chai, Hatch End Reform Community, and scholar in residence at the Liberal Jewish Synagogue, and Rabbi Benji Stanley from Westminster Synagogue, who will be closing this meeting with a reflection and blessing before breaking the fast. My special thanks to Rabbi Igor Zinkov, who is hosting the meeting via Zoom. Last Shabbat, we read from Parashat Kedoshim, the passage from Leviticus that stands at the very center of the Torah. It's also the passage we read on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. And there it is written, Lo ta'amod al damai echa ani Adonai. You shall not stand by idle when your neighbor's blood is being shed. I am the eternal one. Now the rabbinic commentaries on this verse see in this particular law the sixth of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. But there is something more in this verse from Leviticus. Not only do not murder, but don't be indifferent when you see your neighbor's blood is being shed. Don't turn away, don't hide yourself when you see injustice when you see the shedding of blood, but also don't hide yourself when you see the assassination of the culture and ways of a whole people, their history, their religion and language, their music, their literature and art, their cuisine and education, their names. Tonight in the very week that we commemorate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, the end of the Second World War in Europe, and the disclosure of the murder of six million Jews, it is right and appropriate for us to hear and learn, and in our changing world, to do something about the gross and violent injustices that are being perpetrated against our Uyghur brothers and sisters. So, Again, a very warm welcome to all of you who joined us this evening and a particularly warm welcome to those of you from the Uyghur Muslim community. We are really honored to have you with us this evening. And I'd like to hand over to Mia Hassanson Gross now, who's going to introduce the evening and our speakers. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Rabbi Alexandra, and thank you to Liberal Jew Synagogue for hosting this event in partnership with Rene Kassan. Rene Kassan, the Jewish Voice for Human Rights, is a human rights organization that represents a community that sees itself as speaker by experience. 
that is able to campaign and stand in solidarity with other persecuted minorities. We draw our work from themes and experiences that resonate with Jewish values and Jewish history and use that to act on behalf of other discriminated against and marginalized communities here in the UK. We take our name from Monsieur René Cassin, who co-drafted the Universal Declaration for Human Rights in response to the horrors of the Holocaust, with the hope expressed then for future generations in the words, never again. Yet history has concerning predictions for what will happen to Muslim Uyghurs if that reality doesn't happen. It is estimated that since 2017, the Chinese government has arbitrarily detained close to 3 million Muslim Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in re-education camp in China's Western Xinjiang region or East Turkestan, where they are forced to deny their religion and culture as backwards and dangerous. Whilst considered by many as the largest scale detention of religious minorities since the Holocaust, the Chinese authorities refer to these camps as vocational, educational and training centers, which serves the purpose of combating terrorism and religious extremism. However, leaked evidence reveals that many people are detained simply for things like sorting, uh, sporting long beards or wearing a veil, accidentally visiting foreign websites or at times for no clear reason whatsoever. Survivor accounts and satellite images reveal that the re-education centers resemble prisons. Detainees are subject to torture, mass surveillance, heavy policing, forced Mandarin classes, all in a bid to control and doctrine Uyghur Muslims and other ethnic minority groups. The Chinese government does not only prohibit worship of religious beliefs and, is, and attempts to re-educate, but it also forces Uyghurs to directly contravene what they believe as principle to their culture and religion. The range of people detained in these camps vary from the elderly to intellectuals, celebrity, celebrity um, artists, all being detained by um, as part of the wider Chinese government's effort to subdue and erase Uyghur culture. In December 2019, following widespread international condemnation, Xinjiang's local government declared that all trainees and graduates from the centers are being returned to society. However, we know that's not the case. Not only are most inmates not released, but they cannot contact family members beyond prescribed contact according to what is uh, dictated to them um, by the Chinese authorities. Those who attempt to contact the outside world, whether from within a camp or just from within China, face serious threats to their liberty or life. The use of mass surveillance technology, like that provided by the infamous Huawei company, um, used by the Chinese government means that Uyghurs, even if they live somewhere far away, outside of China, Chinese borders, um, uh, cannot contact family or friends uh, abroad for fear of dangerous consequences to them and to their families left behind. And in this current crisis um, that the entire world, world finds itself, um, in the face of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, while stringent measures um, were introduced to curb the spread of the virus by the Chinese government, credible reports, recent reports leaked and leaked video footage revealed the continued movement of Uyghur workers transported via segregated trains, sounds eerily familiar, to forced labor sites in Xinjiang and mainland China. The transfer of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities predates the pandemic. However, recent evidence adds to mounting concern regarding the health and well-being of Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims 
Um, and moreover, those Uyghurs still in camps and still in the wider Xinjiang region face starvation and severe con health concerns because of lack of access to basic food supplies and protective equipment. The Jewish experience of religious and ethnic persecution shows us the importance of being able to both hold our belief and express it freely and crucially to stand in solidarity with, other, with, with others experiencing what we have. In our partnership with the uh, Uyghur community here in the UK and with the World Uyghur Congress, we try to do just that. And that's why I'm delighted and honored to introduce and invite Dalkin Issa, president of the World Uyghur Congress, to share his welcome words. Dalkan, please unmute yourself. You should be able to do that now. And we welcome your words. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ramazan Mubarak. I'm very happy to participate in the Solidarity Iftar with all of you. I would like to sincerely thank Rene Kazin and the Liberal Jewish Synagogue for organizing this event today. Rena Kazin and Liberal Jewish uh, Synagogue and the Jewish community in UK have been among most outspoken against the current crime against the humanity being perpetrated against the Uyghur people in Turkestan. We are grateful for your concern and the solidarity at this difficult time for the Uyghur people. Now, I would like to also say, uh, I heard today, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Benji is fasting one day for, to show the solidarity for the Uyghur Muslim. I would like to send my warm regards to him. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of the solidarity and the understanding, we are very uh, pleased to take part in this online start. Ramadan is one of the most important time of the year for the Uyghur Muslim. The holy months of the Ramadan not only connected us with our faith, but also with our Uyghur identity and with our homeland. In the Uyghur diaspora, we fondly remember holding the iftar in Turkestan when we were growing up. It united our community, bring friends and the family together, and the strength of social bonds. Sadly, for most of our, us in the diaspora, holding iftar in Turkestan with my friends, family is no just a, a memory. It has been over 20 years since then. I was forced to feel my homeland after leading pro-democracy protests in late 1980s. In the last two years, I have lost both of my parents. At least one, my mother, died in the concentration camp. As a Ramadan is the time of for faith, family, and the community. I feel their absence during this period. I miss sharing this moment with my brother, who were both disappeared by the Chinese Communist Party, and my other family members who I have not been able to see or even talk to. In the diaspora, we have kept our religions, culture, and identity alive by the continuum to observe Ramadan as we had in the strict start. But current Christ is my homeland cast heavy shadow during this period. This year has been particularly painful as the current pandemic caused by the CCP phase seven and the lack of the transparency has made it nearly impossible for the Uyghur around the world to observe the holy month of the Ramadan in any traditional sense. Chinese officials have described Islam as an ideological illness that must be eradicated. Actually, Chinese Communist Party is anti-religious organization. 
But, but recently, particularly for the Islam, really targeting and the Uyghur Muslim. So the mass arbitrary detention of Uyghur in concentration camp indoctrinate of the younger generation of Uyghur, forced to renounce religious identity. Chinese government is trying to undermine and erode religious, religious sentiment entirely. Also, the situation is becoming almost unbearable for the Uyghur people in Turkestan. The compassion shown by the Jewish community is heartwarming and give us hope for the futures. While we are unable to be with our friends and the family in Turkestan during this time, we are, are very happy to be able to hold this start with our new friends like yours. If we want to live in a world free of atrocity, hate, persecution, this sort of empathy and understanding between community is essential. As we convene tonight, I would ask that you hold all those who are suffering in Turkestan and around the world in the your thought. We hope that all collective action will help to bring about an end to the crime in Turkestan and help to create a better world where the phrase never again is a fact rather than an aspiration. Thank you and Allah bless us. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dalkan. Really inspiring words and for sharing your story with us. I would now like to invite Rahima Mahmoud, an inspiring individual, woman, human rights defender, who I feel privileged to also call my friend, to share and introduce members of the UK's Uyghur community and their stories. Rahima, if you could please unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Mia, and uh, all our Jewish friends who made uh, this evening happen. And actually, it's the first group iftar, and uh, it's very significant. For me, it's very significant. I am all by myself uh, for the last uh, almost one month. And, uh, I, you know, because of the lockdown and uh, having this event, um, feeling uh, friends around the world uh, is a very uh, beautiful feeling. And I'm sure all my fellow Uyghur friends are also uh, feeling the same. As uh, President Tolkanisa said, uh, it, Ramadan is, is a... Um, most beautiful month for the for the muslims and also is a month for us to spend most time with families and i was i grown up in a large religious family and nine siblings so ramadan we always had the the best time and uh, f apart from uh, fasting it was uh, it's always been uh, the beautiful memories and it's also for us, it's a very, very sad time. But faith keeps us going. And we believe uh, that uh, one day we will be free, especially when we have friends like you. And I would like to invite first uh, Dilnas. Um, I believe she is, she is here. Dilnas Kerem, are you there? Maybe she Yeah. Hello. Hi, Dilnas. Yes, uh, so I would invite Dilnas to uh, introduce herself and share her and her family story. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Uh, so I hope you're safe and having a great time 
fasting during this lockdown. So my name is Dilmaz Kirin. I'm 17 years old. Uh, I was born in Norway and I moved to London at uh, October 2016 with my family. I'm going to testify for my little kids today. So 30 years ago, my father was prisoned for six months and he, he was blamed for committing crime. Uh, he was tortured and was brought to the condition where he could not walk by himself. He was killed after he was released and uh, he had to migrate from his homeland. So it has been 26 years since he migrated from his homeland, uh, from the land he was born and spent his childhood. And he, can, he still cannot return back home uh, as he will be tortured till death. It has been 30 years. He still has the prints of the scars on his body from the persecutions he had to go through in the prisons. Summer 2011, I, my mother, and my two siblings first time visited my, uh, visited my relatives in East Turkestan. So I and my siblings were so excited. Uh, we were packing our luggages a few months before the holiday. We were even counting days. Um, we were very excited. Uh, however, the police and the inspectors turned my excitement into a fear. So for the first uh, three days and nights, police and inspectors from every single town and city came to my grandmother's house and asked us general and private questions. What we do, who we contact with, and why we visited my relatives. They asked us from where we live to what we eat. We had to wake up from our warm, comfy sleep and sit outside on the cold, tough benches, listening to my mother answering the same questions 50 times. There were police around the house and the farm with huge weapons. They even took us to police stations and check our passports, visa, and ask even more questions. They didn't allow us to stay with my grandmother but, and they decided to place us to a hotel. However, after we insisted them, um, they allowed us to stay with my grandmother, but they threatened us to not talk about what the policeman did to us but only talk about the good things that happened there. So we had to agree to be able to stay with my grandmother and we, uh, we had to keep in touch with the Norwegian embassy in Beijing to make sure that we were safe there. Uh, many people think that the Chinese government started to put pressure on Uyghur people first time on, in 2017 and that's wrong because I witnessed pressure in East Turkestan in 2007, uh, 2011. So there were gates at every district with two policemen. And every time we passed those gates, um, the policemen would check us and ask us where we go and why. Um, my relatives had to have an acceptable reason to be able to get a permission from the headman of the village uh, to travel to another city or town. Um, also, the government never gave my relatives passports, which means they couldn't uh, travel abroad. I might be eight years old at that time, although I remember many things that happened there. As you know, millions of Uyghur people uh, are missing in East Turkestan, and my relatives are one of them. This includes my eight years old grandmother, uncles, aunts, and cousins, and they have been missing since summer 2015. We have been trying to reach to our relatives many times for many years, and still we couldn't reach them. Yesterday, we found the contact number of Shayar Town Police Station Bureau, and we called them frequently. Most of the times, we couldn't get connected with them, and they barely answered us. However, when they answered our calls, um, they lied to us and they threatened us to not call them again. Otherwise, they would complain to us, they complain about us. Uh, we do not know where they are how the conditions are uh, or what they're doing. And we are worried about them because we're receiving horrible news about the oppression since 2017. First, large amounts of internment camps were built and the number of Uyghur people present went up to millions. The Chinese government refused to call them internment camps but called them re-education centers where uh, people's terrorism and extremism groups are removed. However, I see this as 
brainwashing innocent people's minds and control lives. Then Uyghur people are moved from the homeland to the mainland China and we do not know what had happened to them. And now innocent people are forced to work in factories as modern day slaves. Brands like Nike, Adidas, Bush and Huawei are using forced labor products. I'm worried about my relatives and their conditions. Hearing all the news, hearing all the terrifying news about all the people in East Turkestan makes us stressed and depressed. Waking up in freezing cold sweats from the awful nightmares and fear that our actions will put our relatives into even terrible conditions. I have the right to know if the ones that I love are alive or dead, no matter what. No one has the right to tear apart families. Therefore, I demand the Chinese government to show me my family and allow us to keep in touch freely. Now, the whole nation is under threat and we don't uh, want our beautiful language, people, tradition, custom and history to be wiped out in the next generation. So we as, Uyghur, as UK Uyghur community have been demanding for help and support from the UK government to stand against China's human violation and Chinese Communist Party's propaganda to stop the genocide of Uyghur people. And I thank the Jewish community from the bottom of my heart on behalf of my family, uh, UK Uyghur community and all the Uyghurs who are campaigning and supporting the Uyghurs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dilmaz, that's, uh, that's a very great um, inspiring uh, speech. And uh, um, I must say, Dilnaz is, is uh, how old are you, Dilnaz? I'm 17. Yeah, she's the young, youngest uh, um, person among us, I believe. And uh, now next, I would like to invite um, Qurban Nisa, my friend. Um, or Rehan Nisa? Qurban Nisa, salam alaikum. Um, yeah, uh, I would like to say thank you to Jewish community, uh, to the Jewish community for the solidarity Uyghur people and for organizing this nice event. And my name is Kurban Nisa. Um, I don't want to be repeat what the, uh, the before the, our president Don Kuhn and Rahima and Kulnas' talks. I just briefly say my uh, personal story. Uh, I haven't seen my fam. I haven't contacted with, with my family since 2000, and I don't know if they are alive or not. Um, so uh, it's really affected my family life and my uh, daily life. So it is unimaginable that this is happening in 21st century. The world is silent and isn't taking any action. And, but it's a uh, little bit relief that communities such as yours, you are talking about us and supporting us. And as uh, I would really say thank you. China may be economical, economically powerful, but I don't believe that is the real power. Uh, and the second Holocaust is happening to the Uyghurs now. It makes me think uh, who is next, who is going to be next. The world must think about this and come together to stop China. And this, is, this has really affected my family and made my daily life. And it's hard to, for me to explain. This short amount of time is not enough to express my pain. Uh, and the life needs to go on. I can't ask you, I can't ask much from you, but you can spread this word to anyone you know. And uh, so uh, this is not only my personal story, it's happening all the Uyghur people in the world now, outside world. It's terrible and horrific human, humanitarian tragedy. And uh, so, 
and I would like to say thanks again one more time for you organizing this kind of event and always supporting us. And thank you very much to Jewish community and giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Qurban Nisa. Now I would like to invite our last uh, uh, panelist, I would say. Um, Aisha, is Aisha here? Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving your time. And thank you very much for showing your solidarity and your care for the Uyghur community here and in our homeland. As we all heard from the uh, World Uyghur Con <coughs> Congress, our President Dokunesa and uh, our uh, very brave and activist sister, Rahima Mahmoud, and all the other two Uyghurs before. So I, I also will not repeat what we have heard from the media, what we are been suffering day in and day out. I am also the same person. I heard, I wake up with the news and I look for what's happening in the Uyghurs, in what media, what's coming in, and how much awareness is going on. Because I can't live without knowing it. But the uncertainty, what's happening back home, it always worries me. And it's a really stressful time, but I'm really thankful your community and showing that fasting according to your belief, according to your religion is not a crime, which is in China and in Chinese regime, Uyghurs not only able to practice their religion, but also we are already <coughs> outlawed to, uh, to speak or promote our own culture. Therefore, I really thank you for having us today. And also, we are able to see each other, some of the people in our community. I'm really happy to see them here and show our support to each other. <clears throat> I want to also uh, <clears throat> share some of my personal story, personal uh, personal story happening to me since 2017. In March 2017, my contact with my family back home <clears throat> cut by the authority just because I sent a Happy Mother's Day gift, a little bit money to my mom to say Happy Mother's Day. Since then, I was not able to know what's going on to my brothers, my sisters and my family. I haven't heard from them and I don't know. That's why this uncertainty always with me and I'm really concerned about their whereabouts. And also beyond, not only from my family, my friends, my colleagues, my classmates, my friends, and there's a wider Uyghur community and mostly the academics. We have academics, writers, poets, all walks of people from all walks of life. They are until now, we can't hear from the most important figures. So let alone the ordinary people. We are raising awareness through different channels, through media, but we couldn't, we couldn't reach out what's really happening to them. But thankfully, there is some national media like BBC, CNN, and uh, uh, in Europe and other places, people like you, like yourself, showing the humanity to the current situation of Uyghurs. And you are not letting us suffer, suffer this alone. You are hearing us, you are helping us to raise our voice. You are helping us to show the humanity care. What China, sorry, Chinese authority doing is correct, is not correct. They are, doing, they are doing something against, hum, uh, against humanity, not only against Uyghurs. As my fellow Uyghurs uh, sister said, this is happening to us. It happened in Second <clears throat> World War towards the Jewish community. Now it's happening to us. We, we don't know whom will be the next. So 
we've been raising awareness over the three years. However, the, uh, the main governments, the democratic nation, they are raising their concerns, but not showing enough action. So <clears throat> my hope is also same with my fellow other Uyghur brothers and sisters. We would like to raise, not only raise our voice, it's also we ask the government to take action, to <clears throat> speak to speak with the Chinese authority to show their real concern in action. And uh, yeah, another uh, personal feeling I would like to share is two months ago, there, uh, <clears throat> one of my friend, Christian friend, husband passed away. And then another Muslim friend, mother passed away. We visited them, at least we show our condolences to them, but we don't know. We don't know how many of our family members, our friends, or other Uyghurs community back home, they, they passed away or they're in jail or for how long? We don't know anything about that. This unknowing situation worries me most. So when I went to, the, went to see my friend after her mother passed away, I hugged her. I told her, at least you able to go to your father's grave to say, to pray for her. At least you go to your, you go out with your uh, families around in the UK, or you can send your message. You share your feelings with any of your relatives around the world, whoever, wherever they live. But we, we don't know the, what condition our parents are, our siblings, or our community are. Without knowing, we don't know how many of them passed away or what situation they are in at the moment. Three years passed, still the silent. So this unbearable situation, we need to raise our voice and we want to make, make awareness such as what you've been doing. I'm really, really, I really appreciate. And also, I really touched about what you uh, what you are doing, uh, taking your time and organizing this event, listening to us. This is such a simple thing for talking to someone, finding some comf uh, find some comfort. But we are not only one or two person. At least today, I can see sixty two person, sixty two people. We are sitting together. We hearing each other. This make me feel more comfortable than just sitting there staring at the sky and praying alone. But there's, this also gave me a hope. Hope as a community cares, people cares, people do help and they do really want to help. So I really cherish this spirit and this is actually what the uh, really harmonious society should be doing, the civilized society should be doing, which is China side, it's lack of. China is just disconnecting everybody from sharing any good things, even let alone any bad news, but good news as well. In the holy months of Ramadan, we are not able to speak, able to send a message of Ramadan Mubarak to our family, friends, anywhere, but we still hope this world will hear. There are people like yourself and other communities and many more people, they are listening to us, they're helping us. So we will, one day we will reconnect with our families and the friends. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. So that is the end of the uh, personal testimonies and pa I pass it to Mia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rahima, and thank you for all um, our speakers um, for sharing your stories and, and your hopes. 
uh, we share your hopes um, with you. Um, I'd like to invite now Rabbi Laura Janner Klausner, Senior Rabbi for the Movement for Reform Judaism. Laura, if you could please unmute yourself. I did. Okay. Thank you. Friends, Salam Aleikum, Ramadan Karim. It is a privilege to, to listen. But when we, don't, when we listen to what we've just heard, it's not like other listening. We are witnesses. And when we are witnesses, we're compelled to do something. And we are and we will. The echoes of the Uyghur situation to Jew situation are echoes we never wished to hear again. And as we listen to you tonight and in other times, we want to say to you that you're not alone. You can see all the people on the screens and they represent so many others who are alongside you, who have been alongside you, and we commit to continuing to be alongside you. It's not enough just to raise our voices. There has to be action and lobbying, and we will help you with this. When we get to the end of uh, reading a book of the Torah, uh, we stand up and we say, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazek. Strength, strength for, for us, strength for you, and by, by each of us having strength, we give each other strength. That's why it's three times, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazek. We will take strength together and be strengthened by each other. So as you come to the end of your fast, including Rabbi Benji, good on you, um, we say, Chazak, Chazak, Renit Chazek. We will continue to be alongside you, to listen, to learn from you, and to strengthen each other in words, but much more importantly, in deed, in deeds. Ramadan Karim. Thank you very much, Laura. I'd like to invite now my partner in crime, Rabbi Michael Hilton, who a year ago, I think, um, stood up in a room that Rene Kastan hosted on the Uyghur situation and said, we have to do something and we have to stand in solidarity. And you did a year ago, Michael, and I invite you to do that today as well. Well, thank you very much, Mia. It's been such a moving event. Assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone on Ramadan Mubarak. It's a privilege to be with you and hear so many moving and such difficult stories. I'd like to start with a lighter moment. Um, you can see on the screen a traditional regal bread called Gir de Nun. And don't they look like bagels? Uh, Maria Balinska draws attention to them in her book on the wonderful book on the history of the bagel and feels they may be one of the oldest prototypes. Um, so you see, we have, we have such a lot in common. Um, just let me stop that now. Come back to me. Um, it's a particular privilege tonight uh, to hear Rahima. Uh, last year, uh, your community kindly presented me with a copy of this book, which you've translated, uh, The Land Drenched in Tears, uh, the memoir of Soyungul Chanishev. Uh, she was a press march earlier in the early days of communist China, and she was a student in the early 1960s, a medical student. And she saw her people being oppressed back then. Uh, there was a great famine in China, and the food from the Xinjiang region was being forcibly taken away to other parts of China. Meanwhile, uh, ethnic Chinese, seemingly poor ones, were being uh, sent in by train to live in the area. Um, and Soyan and her friends started a people's party, a liberation movement, 
I say started, it seems to have been confined mainly to a few students talking in their rooms, but she soon found herself arrested, imprisonment, labour camps, service that went on for 20 years until she and her family were able to leave for Australia. I've chosen an extract to read to you about another Muslim festival, not Ramadan, but the, the Korban, the Eid al-Adha. This is written on the 4th of May, 1963, and it's entitled Korban Eid in Prison. Today is the Korban festival. I was dreaming when I was awoken by the loud noise of the water buckets being brought to prisoners for washing. I opened my eyes to find myself still in prison. I have made myself familiar with the prisoners who've delivered the food and water to my cell over the last four or five days. They shouted through the door hatch, it's the Korban Eid festival today, happy Eid. Unfortunately, you're spending your eat here in prison, but there is good news. You're having carrot pilau rice for lunch today, said the man handing the water over to me. I thanked him. I washed my face. I exchanged well wishes for Eid with my teacher, who was in the next cell and who I could talk to through the wall. He said, all of your comrades send you their Eid blessings. I thanked him and asked him to send my kind wishes to them. I'm starting to get used to life here. I rise early. After breakfast, I exercise by walking from one end of the cell to the other, seven steps each way. I do this nonstop for two hours. I pretend I'm walking along the road and imagine the shops and buildings, trees, streets and people. It helps. I finish my morning exercises before we take into the toilet between 10 and 12. As I wait for my turn to go, I stand next to the door, peeping through a little hole, trying to see the people passing along the corridor. Sometimes I write in my diary or write letters to my friends. I then tear the letters out and then it's lunchtime. And then I try to take a nap. But often I can't because an overwhelming feeling of sadness overtakes me. But today, the radio is played through the loudspeakers as the Korban Festival, relaying many beautiful songs. Reminds me that this had been the happiest time of the year for me. And I can't stop thinking of the times I used to spend with family and friends. I used to spread my new clothes on the bed and go and touch them every few minutes. I would wipe my new shoes with a cloth, even though they were shining. I was so excited then that I didn't know where the best place to display them was. We used to wake my parents early, not caring how tired they had been preparing the food for us. We would go to their room and wake them up and jump around. Eid is here, Eid is here. When my father left for the mosque, we always followed him into the street. I love to watch people stopping every 10 steps to call tech beer, that's Allahu Akbar, one group after another. The constant stream of people entering the mosque reminded me of an endless piece of string. The sounds of the tech beer were so beautiful and uplifting. It always made me feel happy and blessed to be a Muslim. After prayers, Men would first go to the graveyard to pray for their loved ones before returning home to distribute Eid money to the children. And after this, they would start visiting families, friends, neighbours, colleagues and acquaintances in turn, regardless of whether people are rich or poor. And this would last for three days. Today, I'm spending my Eid in prison. I can't imagine how sad my parents and siblings must feel inside. The thought of them being sad because of me was unbearable. 
I always tried my best to drive my despondency away by telling myself, dictators can never break us by terrorizing us or caging us in prison. We will always live about them, empowered by our greatest dreams. We have friends everywhere. Even in prison, we are not alone. I must stand up straight and proud with my comrades in happiness, regardless of where I am. These uplifting ideas sustained me. And indeed, her spirit was not broken. Uh, she kept it up for so many years. The stars brightened the sky as the darkness spread. My Lord lightens my heart amidst the clouds and darkness of my fate. We meet together in solidarity and also in hope. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Such inspiring words. Um, the word hope keeps on coming up. We take hope from despair, and, and that is how we prove our oppressors wrong. Um, it's my great honor now to invite Mr. Turgunjan Alaudun, Director of, Com of the Committee for Religious Affairs of the World Uyghur Congress, to share a special Quran reading with us. Turgunjan, if you could please unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Ben Turgunjan Alaldun. Yeah, I'm uh, Turgunjan Alaldun. Unfortunately, I don't speak English. Ben bu birbirine yerden şemkanlı şiftar çağırdı Allah mülkün köp rahmet eylesin. It is my honor to be here today joining this iftar event tonight. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا قتلنا به وافعنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله العظيم رحمة Thank you شكرا um, Rabbi Benji Stanley, I'd like to invite you now to help us break the fast together with words of reflection and, and closure. Assalamu alaikum. 
we learned in our Torah reading just a couple of days ago when we read the Hebrew Bible, Lot Hamod al Dam Reecha, do not stand upon the blood of your neighbor. We're here and we want to continue to be here in solidarity, but we should not stand upon the suffering of our neighbors. Our medieval commentators guide us in how to be sensitive to the fullest repercussions of this commandment. Rashi, the 11th century French commentator, says if you see a person in mortal danger and you can do anything, then you must. The Malbin, the 19th century Russian commentator, extends this, simply saying, if you can help anyone besakana in danger, then you must. The law not to stand upon the blood of one's neighbor is given in the same verse as the law not to spread tales or rumors amongst your people. And so we ask, what is the relationship between these two laws? Ibn Ezra in 12th century Spain says that we know how slander can endanger people. And so we must act in the face of such slander. And yes, we do. We do know the way that prejudice and persecution, the way that discrimination are mortally dangerous. The Malbim says that the law not to stand upon the blood of one's neighbor comes after the law against spreading tales to let you know that when something is true and truly wrong, then in those situations, you don't say stay silent. In those situations, it's your responsibility to speak out and to witness. The language of the commandment, do not stand, is telling. Do not stand upon the blood of your neighbor. To stand on the blood of your neighbor is to go about in the world, actively pretending that you cannot see, going about your everyday business. So tonight, and we thank you for it, has been a chance to hear and to see, to be in solidarity, ready to do whatever we can do. Rather than ever standing upon, we hope to stand with our neighbors, our friends, our fellow minorities, who the Torah teaches us are to be loved as ourselves, for we were slaves in Egypt. I want to thank all of those who made this evening of sharing and solidarity possible. Thank you to Rene Kassan, the Jewish Voice for Human Rights, and to their executive director, Mia. Thank you to the Liberal Jewish Synagogue, to Rabbi Igor Zinkov for overseeing the technology, and to Rabbi Alexandra Wright for helping to host the event. Thank you to Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner and Reform Judaism, and Rabbi Michael Hilton for your contribution and for all your drive and energy in making this happen. Of course, thank you greatly to President Dolkan Issa, Director Turganjan Alodan, the World Uyghur Congress, Rahima, and the other members of the UK Uyghur community, Dilnaz, Korbanisa, and Aisha. Thank you for sharing with us. And actually, um, can we even express that appreciation with some sort of uh, virtual, uh, virtual clap, even while on mute? Okay. Um, and uh, as I have fasted today, I've been watching uh, the end of fast times carefully, and I understand it's 8.32. Um, so, uh, as on our Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, I'll make sure that I speak for one more minute. Um, you know, what will happen now? And I want to say this, this fast has been quite difficult. I am, um, you know, I think I, this is the first 
uh, day of Ramadan fast that I've done in solidarity and in Judaism we do a couple 25 hour fast and I've always naively thought uh, it's just a daylight fast is probably okay um, but actually uh, I really admire your spiritual discipline it's uh, if you're not getting up early and I wasn't uh, in the middle of the night to pray uh, and to eat then it's basically a 25 hour fast so uh, you know, well done to you and uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, after saying a blessing, um, I'm going to have a sip of, um, of what I'm breaking my fast on, which I think is not traditional. It's just a glass of water because it's uh, what I need most. And I have brought a date as well. Um, so I will say a blessing uh, from my tradition, um, which blesses um, the divine that brings each and everything into being and each and every one into being with their words um, and please when i say that blessing feel free um, if you do have some food that you want to uh, just to begin your meal together feel free to say uh, your own blessing and after uh, having a little sip or nibble there's a chance for a few minutes, I think, for people to stay on the call uh, if they wish to, in order to talk to others and enjoy beginning this uh, this iftar together. Um, so I say, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Shehakol Nihye Bidvaro. Amen. Ramadan Mubarak. Okay. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak, everyone. And Ramadan Karim. I got all my favorite fruits ready. <laughs> Thank you.